The Gospel of Luke in the Bible, in the New Testament, it's the third book of the New Testament, the Gospel of Luke in chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, and reading from verse 46. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Uh, not too long ago in this series, we looked at that word repentance. Tonight, I want to focus on that next phrase that we have been commanded to preach, remission of sins. Over a couple pages to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. John chapter 1 and verse 29. <clears throat> the next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That is all we will read. The word remission is a word that is still used in our language. Uh, in our everyday language really today. Perhaps you have heard, and likely in an audience <clears throat> just like this here tonight, uh, there is somebody whose life has been directly affected uh, by someone close to them who has had cancer. Um, and you have heard about those who have been battling cancer and through different interventions that are uh, done, the cancer is in remission. And that's the word that we have read here today except it's not the remission of cancer, it's the remission of sins. And I want to tie a direct link to what was preached here by John the Baptist. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away or who bears away the sin of the world. You see, the word remission just means a release. Some translations would have it forgiveness. But again, another word that has religious and spiritual overtones and sometimes hard to explain. The word itself in the original language here just means a release. It means to be removed from or to be set at liberty from. And here the Lord Jesus says, go tell everyone that they can be released from sin. John the Baptist preached, behold the Lamb of God who takes away or removes or bears away the sin of the world. When it comes to being released or being relieved, if you will, from something, the first thing I think of is a burden. A burden. Maybe there's people here tonight and you've been affected by a burden of financial debt. And maybe it's piled up, whether it be a student loan or whether it be a house mortgage or even in the last year and a half with the COVID climate and financial uncertainty, just the various burdens. We are living in a very burdened world with all kinds of things that are affecting people today. And uh, yet I want to speak to you tonight about the heaviest burden that a person has ever felt. Heavier than a burden of a loan that you might have, heavier than even a illness, Heavier than a mortgage, heavier than maybe even a relationship that can cause burdens on people, a relationship and conflict or even desires. All of those can cause real burdens. And yet this is the heaviest burden that a person has ever felt. And it is the burden of sin. I wonder today if you have ever felt that burden. Have you ever felt the burden of you? Your sin. Now, when I say feeling, I'm not talking about something that tenses up your muscles. I'm just talking about something that you, it is, in, it is ingrained deeply in your conscience or in your mind. Something you, you think about or can't stop thinking about. Sin. Now, we're living in a world today where people don't think about the burden of sin. In fact, in our society, we call sin everything but sin. We call it a mistake. We call it, I messed up. We call it, I, I slipped. We call it a failure. But the Bible calls it sin. Now, when's the last time 
you met somebody who called lying sin or called lying a crime, if you will, called, called it what it is in the sight of God. No, we talk about mistakes. We've all made mistakes, people say, when you ask them, have you sent? Sure, sure, we've all made mistakes. We've all failed. We've all slipped. No, my friend, we've all sinned. Every one of us in this tent tonight, in the sight of God, listen to the words of Scripture, Romans chapter 3, all have made mistakes. No. All have slipped. No. All, every seat tonight filled in this tent, Every single person, all, without exception, have sinned. You have sinned, my friend, according to the Bible, and so have I. And the reason sin becomes a burden is not because when we start thinking of the sins we have done, lying, that's a sin, cheating, swearing, all of those things are sin, and murder, and and all the other things that we would all, I think, in this tent agree on. But the reason it becomes a heavy burden is because of the consequences of sin. You see, you and I, for our sin, like there are things I have done in my life that were in direct rebellion against my mother and father, but I will never be held accountable for them. I am already removed from their uh, sphere of, well, maybe not sphere of influence, but at least sphere of discipline, (laughs) at least I think, and I'm already removed from that, and so I don't think I can come under the disciplinary action of them for past sin. But you see, you and I, for every single sin we have done, every lie, everything we have stolen, even if it's stealing music from the internet or movies from the internet, there's a reason it's called piracy, because it's theft and it's sin, and it's never stopped being sin to God. He still views it as sin, and swearing is sin. And in Romans chapter 1, it says that, It's sin to even take pleasure in those who are doing that. So even if you yourself aren't doing it, but you enjoy watching someone else doing it, that's a sin in the sight of God, a sin that he will hold us accountable for. And so when we start to think of not only our own individual sins, and it's not my job tonight to press what yours are, but whatever your sins are, even if it's just one lie, do you realize that God must punish your sin? Do you realize that tonight? It's not that he should punish it. It's that he must punish it. He has to punish your sin because a just good God, a good judge cannot let any crime. And that's what sin is. It is a direct crime against God. He cannot let any crime pass. And so he must judge your sin. The Bible says this. The wages of sin is death. It says that the soul that sins shall die. So even if it's just one sin on my record, and you know, it's amazing. You talk to people and they can swear like nobody's business and they can live in sin and all kinds of different things. And they don't really get burdened about that sin. But for some reason, it's just some on some people's conscience, just one sin. I wonder if there's someone in this tent tonight like that, just one sin. I talked to a person and I thought for sure that they would be convicted about their lying. I thought that they would be worked up about their swearing, worked up about sexual sin. But do you know what gripped them and just broke them? It was an act of bullying that took place in the ninth grade. When they bullied another student in the ninth grade. And they think to themselves, I wonder whatever happened to that kid. I wonder whatever happened to his life. And every time there is a suicide in a high school that takes place because of bullying, the wave comes back over them. And all the other sins that they've committed in their life hardly affect them, but of bullying crushes them. I wonder tonight in this tent if there's one sin on your conscience. One sin. There was a lady hardly connected back home in where in the city I live and distantly connected to a murder that took place. And to this day, She breaks down in the living room when she tells the story of one sin. You know why? Because God is going to hold people accountable for that sin. Your sin, my friend, you are going to have to answer for that sin before God. God must punish that sin. And so you can see why it becomes a very heavy burden. It's not felt on the shoulders. 
It doesn't cause lumbar issues. <laughs> it's felt in the heart. It's felt in the soul. That's why a, a very, very religious monk by the name of Martin Luther, who hadn't committed the sins that even I have committed, he was broken and burdened by the idea that he would have to give an account to God for his sin. And he would stay up longer than any other monk confessing his sins to the people, to the, to the priest. And in the moment he would confess them all, he would get proud for confessing them all. And there's another sin. And back down on his face, he would go. And while I wouldn't encourage you to join any monastery here tonight, I would tell you this. It's a real thing to be awakened to the biggest burden in your life, your sin. That is the biggest burden in your life. If you're burdened today about where you want to apply for college, a, a very important decision, a decision I've had to make once upon a time. If you're burdened about who you would like to marry, vital decision, a decision I've had to make once upon a time. If you're burdened about where you're going to live, financial burdens, very heavy, they can press on us. Friend, tonight, there is no bigger burden on planet Earth than your individual sin. And you will have to answer for your sin. I wonder if you've ever felt the burden. I wonder if you've ever felt it. In your soul, have you ever felt, I am going to have to give an account to God. My sin. And God has already said that the penalty for sin is death. Have I ever felt the burden of that sin? You see, Mr. Higgins and I, we are here not to preach to needs that you already feel. Some of you already feel the need to be maybe more popular or more accepted. The reason the Bible is brought out, the reason the word of God is announced is because there is a need that you have never felt, the need of sin. And you need to start feeling it before it's too late. Because not only is it a very heavy burden, the burden of sin, the death penalty for it, but it's so heavy because of where it will take you. You know, when you see somebody who is heavily burdened with something, maybe it's a backpack loaded with school textbooks, like a good medical school student, or maybe it's something loaded like a construction worker off to work loaded back. You know that it leans a person forward to try to carry the load or it pulls a person back. And I have a few little children. And if I put just the slightest backpack on them, they would just fall over. My friend, do you know for the burden of your sin, do you, do you know where it's going to take you? Do you know that if that burden is not lifted from you, from your heart, do you know where it's going to take you? The Bible says it will take you to hell. The Bible says that. The Lord Jesus says this. Now listen to this. This is not the words of a ranting, raving, fundamentalist preacher. This is the words of Jesus Christ. If you believe not that I am he, you will die in your sin. Burden never lifted. And where I am, you cannot come. You see hell and the lake of fire in essence is to be forever separated from God. Why? Because of sin. Is there anyone in this tent tonight? Is there anyone who would like to have the burden lifted? It's the heaviest burden that can ever be felt. I should just say this to clarify. Maybe there's a question here tonight. If God is so loving, why can't he just lift my burden from me? If my burden of sin on my heart is so awful and it's going to weigh me down to hell, and God is so loving, why can't he just automatically just remove it from me? Well, my friend, according to the Bible, that burden is not only on you, but it is bound on you. And the claims that bind the burden of sin to you is the claims of God's own law. It's not the devil's law. It's not Satan's law. It's God's law that says this. The soul that sins must die. That's the law of God. It's God's law that says the wages of sin is death. And so it's God's own law that binds the burden of sin like a backpack to a person. And the only way to get that burden off is to break the, the chain or to break the, the binding. And how can it be broken? The wages of sin is death. Death. The heaviest burden you'll ever feel. I can tell you, 
I didn't, I wasn't saved when I was 20 something years old after a life of sin. I was saved as an 11 year old boy. But I can tell you, it's a heavy burden to feel that my sin will sink me straight to hell. It's a real thing. It's a real thing. Fact is, when I listen to certain people tell how they were saved, I'm not one of those picky people who, you know, parse up somebody's testimony. But I look for two things. I look for a moment when they got a clear look at themselves and their sin. And then I look for the second thing. And they got a clear look at the Lamb of God who bears away sin of the world. A look at self and a look at Christ saved. You see, it's the heaviest burden a person will ever feel. And I just want to come to the second point now. It's the hardest burden that was ever lifted. You know that to lift a burden off somebody, there's different levels of uh, effort that it will take. If it's just a little burden over a three and a half year old boy, that won't take too much effort, will it? Some of you could do it with one hand. It's a burden from a big construction worker carrying all his tools and a whole bunch of other stuff. Well, that may take a little bit more effort. I want to tell you that to lift this burden off of my shoulder, off of my heart, it took the greatest effort. It was the heaviest burden, the hardest burden to lift. It didn't take any effort from me. I didn't have to do anything. I was under the burden. But for the person to come alongside and lift it from me, you know what it took? Well, just remember now, if you've been listening, that burden was tied to me. It was bound to me by the chains, the claims of death. And so the only way to lift that burden was for somebody who had no burden of their own to die. Now I want to ask you, those of you here tonight, you love your mom and dad as you should. There may be great examples in your life, heroes. It's a good thing. I want you to think of somebody in this world who never had the burden of sin. Can you think of anyone? The most fantastic example of humanity, no matter how great a person they may have been, no matter how well they may have lived, every single person, according to the Bible, in Romans chapter 3, all have sinned. All have sinned. But you know, there was God, God who never sinned, God who cannot sin, God in whom is no sin. And he knew that there was no human being on planet Earth, none righteous, no, not one, says the Bible, none that seeks after God, all gone astray, all turned their own way. He knew that God knew that. And in matchless, wondrous grace, God came into this world and became a man. Why? So that as a sinless man, he could take the burden of my sin and the burden of your sin. And he's just here on the planet Earth. And here's a, a preacher who was living in his day, John the Baptist, a strange preacher. He ate funny food. He dressed funny. You know what he said? Look. Look. The Lamb of God. What's he doing here? He's here to preach great sermons. No. He's here to start a church. No. Look. The Lamb of God who bears away the sin of the world. Our sin. Your sin. That's why he came. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know about you. But a lamb doesn't strike me as a creature that you could put too much of a burden on. You, you, you put a heavy burden on maybe a horse or a donkey or one of these animals. But anything that I know about a lamb, you, put a, you don't put too much of a burden on it. But you see, this lamb was a very different lamb. God's own son. And the reason he's termed the lamb is because he came to take our burden by going to where our burden can be lifted. We sometimes sing the song, don't we? Burdens are lifted at Calvary. We've sung this song already twice in this series. Mercy there was great and grace was free. 
Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty. Where? Where? Calvary. Calvary. That's where the Lord Jesus came as the Lamb of God. And he took our sin. That's what it says so simply. Friends, tonight it says it so simply. In 1 Peter chapter 2, he bore our sin in his body on the cross. Christ also once suffered for sin. And so John the Baptist is announcing to everyone there. It's the same message we're announcing all these years later. Let's not look at us. Let's not look at the gospel hall. Let's not look at any great Christian. It's look, behold, the Lamb of God who can take away, who can lift away your burden. How? Because when he went to the cross, the burden was placed on him. All the weight of it, if you want to know how heavy that burden is, you can look at the cross where omnipotence is crushed. Omnipotence crushed. Crushed on the cross for our sin. Wounded for our transgressions, the Bible says. Crushed for our sin as the burden was placed on him. As he bore in his body all the suffering for our sin. And the Bible says it like this. Christ died for our sin. He took the death penalty. That chain that was binding the burden to me. He took it. He satisfied its claims. It was like the devil saying, see that boy, see that boy, Joseph Baker. He'd never be in heaven. Because he sinned. It's mine. Your law says, God, your soul that sin shall die. He's mine. Jesus went to the cross and he died. He said, no, he's mine. It's mine. And that moment, that transaction happened. They all I did was take a look. <laughs> if it's the heaviest burden, to bear, if it's the hardest burden to lift, then almost logically it seems that it's going to require the greatest effort from you. That's just the opposite. Do you know what it calls on people to do? Just not even I, I'm so, not even with your eyes, not even somehow getting a vision of the cross. No, it's hearing what God's word has to say about the Lord Jesus. That he bore our sin, that he died under that weight, that he rose again the third day, satisfying God for sin. And anyone and everyone, all the world, it says here in John chapter one, who will look to the Lamb of God, who will look to the one who settled sin's tremendous claim. Glory to Jesus. Blessed be his name. Anyone who will look to him will have the burden lifted, the burden taken. For the Lamb of God, look at what it says, takes away the sin of the world. Now, when I was saved, I didn't feel any great weight lifted. It wasn't like I was carrying, you know, 100 pounds of bricks, and all of a sudden when I was saved, I felt the bricks fall off. But I can tell you that the day I was saved and I understood that he was wounded instead of me, while I didn't feel a weight roll off, there was one thing that was on my conscience that night, March the 22nd of 2003. For my sin, I will be in hell. And I lay my, my head on the pillow that night, knowing this burden lifted. I will never be there. I wonder, can everyone here tonight, every single one of you, can you lay your head down on your pillow tonight and know, just to borrow what my brother has said, if I die tonight, I will be in heaven. Can you say that? Do you know that? Because you see, when you all your life, you know that you will be in hell. It's a real thing to have that burden taken and lifted. And so the heaviest burden ever felt is the burden of sin. It was the hardest burden to lift, but the Lord Jesus lifted it. On himself on the cross. God is satisfied with what he has done. 
And it's the simplest response from you. All you need to do is look away from yourself, look away from the preachers, look away from the churches, look away from the creeds, look to the Lamb of God who bore away the sin of the world. And on the authority of the word of God, you will be saved. You will be at total peace. You will have the burden lifted just by a look. I'll close and sit down with this. It's the happiest result that will be enjoyed. You know, cancer, it's been termed the emperor of all maladies. Cancer, sometimes it's put into remission. But you know what happens, don't you? Unfortunately, at times, the person is brought back. Cancer's back too. It was remission for a time. Then it resurfaced. You know why? Because to deal with cancer requires the ingenuity of human beings and the different things that we have concocted thus far. But you see, when God deals with sin, it's permanent, people. When the burden is taken, when remission, when the release is enjoyed, it never comes back. The burden's gone. The burden's gone. I don't know, dear, dear believers here today. I don't know what burdens are in your life. Bereavement, sadness, sorrow. You bow your head tonight to know this. The burden is gone forever. The burden of my sin, it will never come back. You know why? Because whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God doeth. People may praise him. You praise him tonight for what? For the burden lifted. And the release of joy. Would you turn, please, to First Corinthians chapter fifteen? First Corinthians chapter fifteen. And verse one. First Corinthians fifteen and verse. One, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain, that is, unless ye believe something that was not true. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the 12. After that, he was seen of about 500 brethren. Now you notice those four things all indicated by that word that, that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose again, that he was seen. The second one proves the first. He was buried. That, of course, is the proof that he died. The fourth one proves the third. He was seen. And that, of course, is the proof that he rose from the dead. I read about a man who had a court date. He was scheduled to appear before a judge. And on the day that he was to be there, he was absent. His son was appearing in his place. And somewhat annoyed, the judge said to him, why is your father not here? He was scheduled to appear before me today. Why is your father not here? And the son spoke up and said, your honor, there are 17 reasons why my dad couldn't be here today. And the judge, annoyed, said, and what are the 17 reasons? And the man said, well, first of all, he died a few days ago. Secondly, and the judge stopped him. Wait a minute, did you say he died? Yes, Your Honor, he, he died a few days ago. Then really, you don't need to read me the other 16 reasons. That's enough. If you want to know how you can tell that Christianity is the true message from God, all you need to know is one thing. One time, one time in the history of our world, never happened before, one time, a man rose from the dead, a man who had died, was alive and was seen. And it simplifies the whole question about what religion is true and what should I listen to and what should I follow? 
because there is a man who died and was buried and rose again the third day. Now, I want to point out to you that what I have read to you involves the most important weekend in the history of the world. These are three days that shook the world. After this weekend, nothing was ever the same again. Nothing. The Lord Jesus had been alive in this world for more than 30 years. He had been performing miracles and teaching for more than three years. But that unforgettable weekend had a Friday, a Friday of agony and pain when Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture. It had a Saturday of absence and sorrow when Christ, who had been buried, was mourned by the disciples who thought that they would never see him again. And it had a Sunday of resurrection appearances and victory and joy when Christ rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Now, what I have just said may sound to you as though all we are discussing are points of religious doctrine. But you must understand that what I just told you has tremendous implications for you tonight in this tent. Christ was alive. Let's just start right there. The man who had been beaten beyond recognition as a human, who had been hanged on a cross after being mercilessly whipped, nailed to a cross, hanging for three hours, first in the broiling sun and then in the shadows of darkness, had a spear run through his side, likely piercing his heart. That man who lay in a cold, airless, rock-hewn tomb from Friday evening till Sunday morning, that man was not merely back. He hadn't merely recovered from wounds. He wasn't in need of rehab or recuperation and medical assistance. He didn't limp out of the tomb and the disciples feeling sorry for all that he had gone through and, and the appearance of this almost dead man, but he was powerfully alive from the dead. There's a friend of mine that is very well known to a number of people who are here tonight. His name is Bill Brescia. And after a gospel meeting one night, Bill was driving some Nepalese people home to their apartments. They had been coming for quite a while to the meetings. And on the way home, he had two of these Nepalis in the car, one beside him and one in the back seat. The man beside him was in a conversation with Bill, and he was talking to Bill about the philosophy and virtues of Hinduism and the Hindu gods, because he was a Hindu. And Bill was listening respectfully, and then Bill was answering about the Lord Jesus, his works, his words, his miracles. And then Bill said this. There's no other religious leader whose tomb you can visit and say the words, he is not here. He is risen. Only the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only one who rose from the dead. When they pulled in beside the apartments, the man in the back seat put his hand on the shoulder, shoulders of the man in front, leaned over and said to him, Daju, friend, brother, Daju. This changes everything. We need to think about this carefully and we need to make a decision. What was he saying? If the man who died for our sins, if the lamb of God, the sin bearer for the world was hammered to a cross. And then on the Sunday morning following was alive in a resurrected body, never to die again. And that changes everything. And you need to think carefully about this. And you need to make a decision about this gospel. As I said, nothing like this had ever happened before, ever. His resurrection was not a mere return to a former life. There were people who were brought back from the dead. Lazarus, for instance, and John 11. But they were brought back in a mortal body. And they would have to die again. But that wasn't what happened here. Here, there's a man who came alive never to die again. Now, if your response to that is to say, I've never seen anything like that, and I, I, don't, I don't know of anybody else that that has happened to, 
then my response is exactly, exactly. God did something unique that weekend to prove to you the truth of his gospel. If, if people rose from the dead, if somebody rose from the dead every hundred years or every millennium, then this would not be as unique and historic event as it is, but it is unique because Christ is alive. The resurrection of Christ is unique in history and it is unique in all the religions of the world. Just to borrow again from what Bill was saying to that Nepalese friend of his. Abraham died. There's four religions, by the way. There's four religions that are founded not so much on a philosophy, but on a person. Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, the Jewish faith. Abraham died more than 4,000 years ago. His tomb is in Hebron. Medina holds the remains of the death of Muhammad. Buddha's burial spot is known. There's one empty tomb. It's one empty tomb. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Christ is alive. And the implication of that for you is this. Death has been defeated. You say, People die all the time. People I know have died. People I love have died. What do you mean? Death has been defeated. Because what happened as a result of the death and resurrection of Christ is this. He rose from the dead and billions of his people are going to rise from the dead as well. Death was conquered at Calvary and Christ conquered it by dying. How often people remind us that when David defeated Goliath, he used Goliath's own sword, the stone. That hit Goliath in the forehead, knocked him down. But it was Goliath's own sword that David drew and then killed Goliath with it. And at Calvary, the Lord Jesus used the very tool that the devil had employed, death, to defeat death. So now, if the Lord Jesus doesn't come, I'm going to die. The Lord Jesus had not come, had not died, had not risen from the dead. Then death would be a terrifying, frightening, horrific thing for every person saved or not. Of course, no one would be saved if he hadn't come. But because he died and rose again, that has turned death into a servant who escorts a saved person into heaven to be with Christ. That's why Paul said everything is yours when he wrote to the Christians, whether life or death, it's all yours. Because even death, see, even death has to serve as a servant for people who are saved. There's a man whose son died. His name was Sir Norman Anderson. He had been invited to give a discussion on television about the resurrection of Christ. It's a subject that he had written about on a number of occasions. When the producers heard about the death of Sir Norman's son, they got in touch with him and they offered to cancel the interview. We didn't think you would want to come onto television and speak about resurrection when you've just lost your son. No, he said, now I want to talk about it more than ever. Now I want to talk about it more than ever. You see, this is a pretty hopeless world. It's growing all the more hopeless. But people who have believed on the Lord Jesus have hope, a bright future, because we're going to live with Christ forever. Do you know why this has implications for you? Because Christ is alive. It doesn't not only mean that death has been defeated, but it means that salvation has been accomplished. Salvation has been accomplished. We're not telling you tonight that there's a church that you need to join, that there are rules that you will need to observe, that there are steps you will need to take. That there are rites or rituals that you will need to be involved in and that eventually if you are faithful enough you will be able to achieve or obtain paradise heaven salvation the death and resurrection of christ has accomplished salvation he said on the cross it is finished on that lord's day morning god gave a resounding amen by raising his son from the dead 
And as a result of that, salvation is being offered to you as a gift from God. Romans 6 and 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. As a result of that, salvation is presently possessed right now by people who have trusted him. You'll see it just here. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There are people in the tent around you here tonight who have been saved and have eternal life. As a result of the death and resurrection of Christ, eternal salvation is fully assured by God. That's why the Lord Jesus said in John chapter 5, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that hears my word and believes God that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. So now that presents a number of vital questions for you to answer in the quiet of your own mind just now. If salvation is a gift from God, have you received it? It's really not Mr. Baker's or my business to ask you what church you belong to. Do you go? How faithful you are. But it is our responsibility to ask you. Do you have eternal life? Have you received this gift from God up till now in your life? Have you obtained salvation? Maybe it will simplify matters if I just ask you to think about this. Was there a moment in your life when you realized you did not have salvation? Was there a moment in your life when you came to understand that you needed salvation? And therefore, was there a moment in your life when you received it by receiving Christ? You have every right to ask me or to ask us that question. It was a July night in 1966 when I realized I was on the way to hell. I did not have salvation. That was the night that I realized that the, the number one thing, the number one need, the number one requirement in my life is to get this settled, to obtain salvation. And at about quarter to 10 that night, I received eternal life by receiving Christ. Now, do you have a moment like that? Do you have a moment when you received eternal life? If salvation is a gift from God, have you received it? If eternal life is presently possessed, John chapter 3 and verse 36, for instance, says, He that believes on the Son has everlasting life. So if eternal life is presently possessed, do you have it? Now, presently, do you say, well, I hope one day when I die, I hope that I will be in heaven. Or do you know now tonight here that your soul is saved? A moment like that changes a person's life. A moment like that brings eternal life to a human being. You know, somebody goes on a crash diet and they lose, like some of you wonderful people here have lost 20, 30, 40 pounds. And the first person who sees you after they haven't seen you for a while says, uh, I hardly recognize you. You're so changed. Anybody ever say that to you because they notice the change in you spiritually? Anybody ever say, you know, he, he doesn't he doesn't get drunk anymore. He, he doesn't curse anymore. I, when when. Uh, during the Welsh revival, when. Um, Evan Roberts was preaching to the Welsh miners. So they worked down in the mines and they would get up early in the morning and they would use their, uh, they were called pit ponies. They'd have ponies that they would uh, bring to the pit and, and that would handle the transporting of coal and whatever they were mining. When he preached the gospel to them and they were saved, the animals had to learn how to respond to the miners who were no longer cursing. They used to respond when the miners would curse at them and beat them. And, and now the miners were changed. So now the animals had to learn how to respond to a soft voice instead of a, a, a cursing man pushing them down the road. Anybody ever notice any change in you? Is there a moment in your life you could drive a stake into it? And you can mark it on the calendar and you could say, now that was the day. There's a man here and I won't embarrass him by telling you who he is. And I certainly won't embarrass his wife, but uh, he used to run a little snack shop and he had a calendar hanging beside the cash register and he said to us on one occasion why don't you come come for lunch and he picked a date and the day he picked actually was the day after i believe it was the wednesday 
and his wife had just been saved. And the Wednesday had a red marker around it, just a red square around it. We could hear people in front of us, hey, calling him by his name. What's the, uh, what's the day here for circle? Did you hit the lottery? No, oh, he said, my wife got saved. My wife is on the way to heaven with me. View a day like that. Could you mark it on the calendar and say, now that's the day. That was the place. And that was the moment when I received eternal life. If it's fully assured by God, do you know for sure where you're going to be? I can tell you that one of the most wonderful things about God's salvation is the assurance that it brings. You see, if salvation depended on Christ and me, if this was a joint effort between the Lord Jesus and me, what he did and what I did are added together, and then God says I'm saved, then I could never be sure that I was saved because I always fail, and I could never be certain that my part of this work of salvation was done correctly or properly or sufficiently but because salvation is all through christ i can tell you tonight by the grace of god i know i'm going to be in heaven when i die i don't deserve it i'll never deserve it i never have deserved it i never will deserve it but if i drop dead right now before anybody on the front row could touch my body I'd be in heaven with Christ. You know how I know that? Not because I have a happy feeling or I'm a positive thinker or my faith is really strong compared to others. But I have a very strong Savior. And he's the one who says, my sheep will never perish. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand. There was a woman coming to meetings that I was having some time ago. She was a very... Um, trusting person um, she's the kind that if you told her something she would just accept it and believe it and when she told me while we were visiting together three of us were visiting together when she told me that she was saved I wanted to make sure that she wasn't just taking what I was saying so I said to her what if I told you that I don't think you're saved what if I told you that and this woman, who I told you now before, was the kind that depended very heavily on what people said and just, just accepted what they said. When I said to her, what have I told you that I, I don't think you're saved? She said, and I'll give you her exact quote. It don't matter what you think. God says I am. It don't matter what you think. God says I am. And God says I'm saved. Because Christ died for me. Christ was my sin bearer. Christ was the, the lamb of God who bore my sin away in his own body on the tree. Let me close by telling you that because Christ rose from the dead, the future has been secure. Death has been defeated. Salvation has been accomplished. The future has been secure. Paul wrote to Christians in the very chapter we read from, and he said, as in Adam, those who are in Adam die, so all that are in Christ will live. And everybody who has trusted Christ is as sure of being in heaven, if they're not already there, as sure of being in heaven as if they already were. The future has been secure. Now, remember, please, that the very resurrection that proves that there is no judgment for people who are saved proves that there is judgment for those who are not. Acts chapter 17 on Mars Hill in the city of Athens, Paul preached, God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world. He has raised the judge from the dead to give you the assurance of that. And therefore, he is commanding all people everywhere to repent. You could have a future tonight that instead of judgment, is secure for heaven forever. If you trust the Savior who died and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. There's a Christian writer who described traveling with his five-year-old boy one day. And they drove by the local cemetery and a fresh grave had been dug. So there was a funeral going to be coming. But what the boy saw was an empty grave and a pile of dirt by the side. And to the five-year-old's mind, he put the pieces together and he called out to his dad driving the car. And he said, look, look, dad, one got out, right? Look, dad, one got out. And the man said, 
I hardly ever pass a cemetery since that day till now where I don't think to myself. Thank God. One got out. <laughs> One got out. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried. He rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. He was seen of more than 500 people. Trust him tonight. And you'll be resting your soul on a work that can never fail. On a savior that can never be defeated. You'll have a salvation that will never end. You'll live in a heaven that will be glorious forever.